we do. Um, I would just like to take the opportunity to welcome you at the second level of training for the Community Services Chaplains at the IACSC, the International Association of Community Services Chaplains here at my back. Now, um, if you're here for the first time, it means that you, you may come back for the first level of training after this course, maybe in July or even mid-July will start there. Anyhow, um, what this course is about, it's a more advanced level of community services chaplaincy. So do not be frightened after tonight because it's going to be a hectic course, hectic session. So do not be frightened. I will lead you through all of this. So it will be not painless, but you'll have to through the plan you'll gain. Of course, um, a lot of uh, knowledge and skill sets, especially on our second se segment of the work. But when we, we're going to start with um, brainwashing and, and how it relates to domestic violence and so on and so forth, because brainwashing plays an important tool in the perpetrator's um, you know, way of interaction with the victim. So, so yes, for now, welcome. And, then of, and of course, you can watch this online also later on. We also have some other trainings um, and modules you can you can easily request those um, in the in the Bible school I also train chaplaincy so you can also watch those if you would like that will be a um, also um, to your pleasure to watch those but nevertheless thank you for being here let's pray Father God we want to thank you for this opportunity tonight and my prayer is Lord that you will bless us as we take part in this mission the mission of the gospel and, and we know Lord you have sent us all because we are here and we want to thank you, Lord, for sending us in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you for sending us into the field, into the harvest, to collect those in, outside, the, outside the camps of the uh, designated holy places. My prayer is, Lord, that you will bless us as we journey on this um, wonderful road of chaplaincy ministry and ministry outside the gates of the church, ministry of presence in Jesus' name. Amen. So, yes, you're back at the ministry of presence, and that's what chaplaincy is all about. It's about the ministry of presence. It's nothing less, nothing, nothing more. It's just you being there, and of course, you sharing yourself with other people in your um, in your environment. Because all of us, we've got different environments, we've got different places, roles to play, um, things to do in our job, occupation, um, in our ministries, and of course, in that position you're in, God has given you that position. I told the other day, a person, well, I always tell my congregation for that matter. I always tell them, listen, God gave you this job you've got at this point because it, it doesn't only provide for you in your special need, but it also, it also gives you an opportunity to reach people outside the gates of the church. If you're going to sit in the church the whole time waiting for people to come in, you're going to wait forever. You're going to wait forever, and your church will, will, will feel the consequences about that. So, so we need to get out there and, 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 and inform the people about you know, what's going on uh, in the world, because what they see will be their perception. And if they can see a caring church, it also relates to a caring, you know, or caring chaplain. It relates to a caring pastor, as well as a caring congregation. So, yes, we're going to go to page 18, if you will. Um, on page 18, you'll find our segment for tonight. We're going to start over there. And it's, it's quite um, a big bubble to, you know, to get your... Uh, your, your your mouth around. It is a big piece of work, but it's going to be great. And, and we're going to watch also a short little video. So, yes, um, it's going to help us just to, to um, elaborate on the seg this segment, brainwashing or forced conversions. Now, um, this course is, is uh, practical. And, and you will see level one, level two, it's practical on walking in the role um, of community services chaplains. The, the principles of chaplaincy are applicable across a board, spread broad spectrum of ministry environments. And the three parts of this entire training sessions will prepare us, level one, level two, level three, will prepare us in the ministry outside the gates of the church. Now, when we get to level three, you'd see it's more practical than theoretical, but we have managed last year to have a practical one online. Can you believe that? We, we, we had some role players. We invited them in on, online, and, and it was a fantastic first time, level three. Now, people would ask me many times, why do we do this online only? We do not do it online only. We also go out and present these courses to congregations. We, we, we have a scheduled one, as I said, last week here in Rostenburg shortly, and we've got some others 
some other training opportunities scheduled for, for, for some other parts of the country. But for example, the Durban um, Fraternal, they notified me, they said that it's more cost effective for them, for me to train them online than to bring me over there and pay my air ticket and all of that. It's because it's costly and I understand that. So they would rather also prefer that, you know, when I train their fraternal, that we meet online on a, over a weekend or so on and so forth. But we do not do this courses. If we do it online, we, we spread over a time of about three to four weeks. We cannot do it 24 hours um, at once or over a weekend. It will be so frustrating. Um, just to speak to a PC and also for you to listen to a, to a monitor on your end. It will be very frustrating. But let's get to, to tonight's work because it's very important that we get through this. We've got two segments to cover tonight and we'll, we'll have um, a discussion about um, the five, um, five fears of intimacy on, on Thursday. That, uh, that will probably take probably mm, around about an hour or hour, hour and 10 minutes maybe. Um, tonight's session will lead us around about to nine o'clock if all will, if God wills, maybe even earlier, maybe 10 to 9. So um, what brainwashing and forced conversion is, forced conversion is about, it's a psychological field or a study field of, of brainwashing. Often they refer to this as the, the thought reform, to reform a person's thought and thinking patterns. And normally they traumatize a person first, and then they reform the thought process of this person. It falls into the sphere of social influence, of course. And we have seen this um, many times on our social platforms. We, we've seen it on, on Facebook, on Twitter, that people are socially influenced. And also this causes brainwashing. Social influence happens every minute of every day. As we speak, there is social influence. I'm socially influencing you also in a certain sense. Social influence happens all of our lives, all, every day, every time we open our mouth or listen to something. It's the collection of ways in which people can change other people's attitudes, beliefs, as well as behaviors. So it's you trying to change somebody else's behavior. And that's what we call thought reform. And this is what brainwashing is all about, as well as forced conversions. It, 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 it kind of um, amend people's beliefs, attitudes, as well as their behaviors. Now, for instance, the compliance method aims to produce a change in a person's behavior. And it's not concerned with his his attitudes or beliefs. It's the just do it kind of thing. It's the just do it approach. Um, it's not a Nike thing. <laughs> it's not a Nike thing, but then we also see we, through this time of, of, of your training, you'll see there's also the, the, the thing about persuasion, how to persuade the person. On the other hand, it aims for a change in attitude or, or it says um, do it because it'll make you feel good. It make you feel happy or healthy or successful if you can do this or do that. And that's what we call persuasion. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> where did it go now? Yeah, we're still here on page 18, but this is not in your coursework. So don't stress yourself. You won't get in your, this, this in your test, okay? I'll just direct you to the, to the test as soon as we get there. So, um, <clears throat> so this is all about, um, and also brainwashing is about education, educating a person um, with a certain method. And you'll see in our next slide, or after this video, I'm going to show you, how people are educated, which is called the propaganda method or the propaganda machine, when you don't believe in what's being taught, but still it's being flushed down your throat. It goes for, uh, for social influence like gold, you know, and, and it's all about social influence trying to affect a change in the person's beliefs. Now, along that lines, you can say, do it because you know it's the right thing to do. So, and that's what we call education, brainwashing. brainwashing this is a severe form of social influence that combines all of these approaches to cause changes in someone's way of thinking without that person's consent or often against his will. And this is taken from working psychology. If you can go and Google that, working psychology, and you put slash brainwashing, you can find that over there. I also got something from, from some, some other source, and this source is the the brainitica, and, and they say, and they speak about brainwashing, is the, is such an invasive form of influence, it requires the complete isolation and dependency of the subject, which is why you mostly hear of brainwashing occurring in prison camps or totalist cultic groups. Now, as you've, if you're a theologist, and you would probably have known that 
many occultist groups start off with isolating people that is, uh, and even sometimes causing trauma in this person's life and, and, you know, giving their brain a shock. The agent or the brainwasher must have complete control over the target or the brainwash share uh, so that sleeping, um, eating, using the bathroom and all of that, all of that needs a person normally wants and needs. The agent, of course, who is the brainwasher, systematically breaks down the target's um, identity in that course of time, you know, through the course of time, to the point that it falls apart completely. The agent then replaces it, it, replaces it with something else, a set of behaviors, uh, attitudes, beliefs, and so on and so forth, and so on. A cult is born or a, a battered woman believes that the husband still loves her. Um, so yes, I would like to show this video. Um, it's a little small insert, if, 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 if it will play. Let me just see. There we go. A conversation with Mr. Yuri Alexandrovich Besmianov. Mr. Besmianov was born in 1939 in a suburb of Moscow. He was the son of a high ranking Soviet Army officer. He was educated in the elite schools inside the Soviet Union and became an expert in Indian culture and Indian languages. He had an outstanding career with Novosti, which was the, and still is, I should say, the press arm or the press agency of the Soviet Union. It turns out that this is also a front for the KGB. He escaped to the West in 1970 after becoming totally disgusted with the Soviet system, and he did this at great risk to his life. He certainly is one of the world's outstanding experts on the subject of Soviet propaganda and disinformation and active measures. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion is, is the process which is legitimate, overt, and open. You, you can see it with your own eyes. All, all you have to do, all American mass media has to do, is to unplug their bananas from their ear open up their eyes and they can see there is no mystery. There is nothing to do with espionage. I know that espionage intelligence gathering looks more romantic. It sells more deodorants through the advertising, probably. That's why your Hollywood producers are so crazy about James Bond type uh, of thrillers. But in reality, the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of its intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process, which we call either ideological subversion or active measure, active meritriyatia in the language of the KGB, or psychological work. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process, which goes very slow and is divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already uh, for the last 25 years. Actually, it's over fulfilled because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to America, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to 
true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his bad bottom. When a military boot crashes, his, then he will understand but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization. The next stage is destabilization. This time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. Whether you eat junk food and get fat and flat, it doesn't matter anymore. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation. Uh, it's, what, what matters is essentials. Economy, foreign relations, defense system. Uh, and you can see it quite clearly that in some areas, uh, in such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense and economy, uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure, and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis, to promise people all kinds of goodies and the paradise on earth, uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition, and to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., with uh, benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale, who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfillable or not. Your leftists in, in the United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders, they are instrumental in the process of the, of the uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation. When their job is completed, they're not, they not needed anymore. They know too much. Some of them when, when they get disillusioned, when they see that Marxist Leninists come to power, they, obviously they get offended. They think that they will come to power. That will never happen, of course. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. But they may turn into the most bitter enemies of Marxist Leninists when they come to power. And that's what happened in Nicaragua. You remember most of these uh, former Marxist Leninists were either put to prison or one of them split and now he's working against Sandinistas. It happened in, in uh, Grenada when Maurice Bischoff was, he was already a Marxist. He was executed by, by a new Marxist who was more Marxist than this one. Same happened in Afghanistan when uh, first there was Taraki, who was killed by Amin, then Amin was killed by Babra Karmal with the help of KGB. Help of KGB. Same happened in, in Bangladesh when Munjibur Rahman, very prosperous. Right, so now he's just giving some other facts about countries that's being subverted. Communism. Um, communism is a real threat, and it all starts with, you know, it's like brainwashing a nation. I also included this research, Pazlov's research, into my dissertation, um, which was submitted, submitted on the 24th of May to my professor in the U.S. And you must rem this is not for your test. It's just to show you that our world is subdued to communists, and, and, and it, it's, it's all about demoralization, first thing. And then, of course, destabilization. Thirdly, creating a crisis. And we can see it all over the world, especially when you're fixed your eyes on America. You'll see all of these stages has been playing out. And also then they say normalization because after the crisis come the euro and say, um, it's normalized now. We, you know, so, so yes, we need to be very careful for these kind of um, attacks on, on our cultures. You know, As early as 1975, Researchers began to report the similarities of brainwashing techniques used on people of war, so that of battered women. So 
the same kind of stress or post-traumatic stress they found in people of war, they found in found it in you know in women that were battled were battled. So this this power in brainwashing and, and, and that's the prob the problem is the power in the brainwashing and um, there's some videos I could I could show you I, I I cannot remember if I've got one just after this but but um, what are some of the typical stages the victim goes through because there are some stages um, that they will go through and uh, if you turn a page to your manual let me just go and see yes over there. Um, the stages they'll be, they'll be going through. Um, we're still on page 18, if I'm not mistaken. So, and this is what the brainwashing process looks like. It is the first stage is the breaking down the cells. And that's what they do. And then they, they assault your identity. You know, what we see in, in the world right now is like people um, assaulting one another's um, identity. Uh, canceling you if they don't like you or doing this or that to you, you know. And then the second step in the first stage is establishment of guilt on the person, you know. And then the third step is self-betrayal. And the fourth step, breaking point. And that's where they want you. They want to break you. Now, this Pavlo um, Pavlovian theory is a learning procedure that involves also um, pairing a stimulus with a conditioned response. Pavlov conducted um, his research with dogs. Pavlov found that objects or even events could trigger a conditioned response in the dark, of course. Now, the results of his experiment was a new condition response in the dogs. For example, when you do this on, on the table, um, then my little dog over here knows he's going to get a treat. So that's conditioning, and that's causing the dog to react in the way he was supposed not to react normally. Now, this is what the purpose is, breaking your personality, re-educating the person to follow other dogmatics, to follow, follow, other, follow, um, follow other theories, and erase the old personality. Um, I tried that on my wife the other day, but it didn't work. Uh, <laughs> and then also... When you do this, when you do do this in canceling her personality, canceling the person who she is, we see a lot of people being canceled these days, especially when you speak against the wokest. Now, um, we're not going to go there. Don't stretch yourself because I don't have the time for that. Um, I, I will later on maybe do a, uh, give you some study about that and, and show you what my, my theory is about the wokest in the world right now at this point. But, you know, they destroy your personality to take complete control of your faith, to take com complete control, not over your Facebook, but about uh, over your faith, about who you are. And also control of basic biological functions like the eating and the sleeping, as well as the defecation. You cannot go to the toilet. You, you should just sit there and, and wait for something to happen. Now, um, brain, brainwashing uses um, many kinds of ways. And I've got this video now about Patty. Hurst, and it's a, it's a fantastic video, and I just want to check. Um, how was the sound, Marnie? Was the sound okay with the previous video? Because I kind of, for me, it's, I think I must get some earplugs or something to help me listen. <laughs> for me, it wasn't so good, but but nevertheless, let's. We're gonna on the next slide. I've got another video insert, but it's a very important one because um, these are the three uses of brainwashing, and you you should remember this: survival, training as well as control, the STC. Um, so, so first off, survival seen in military boot camp, for example. Um, it's all about survival. you fighting the fight to survive. Um, you know, we've got an axiom in chaplaincy, what we say, and I always use it because in our city here in Rustenburg, our city is going down the drain. These days they start to, to fix the roads up, and I'm quite surprised and also I'm really um, proud that they do they do it, you know, because maybe something is happening at, at least in their hearts. But um, what we see here is um, they've broken into our church sanctuary twice in three weeks, and they made havoc. Especially Sunday morning that just passed, five o'clock in the morning, they stole our mixer. It's a new mixer. It's a um, it's a digital mixer. It works with um, internet signals and stuff like that. Um, it costs about you know, 70,000 or something. 
And we didn't pay for that, but we got it as a blessing. But the, the thing is that, you know, they stole it. They stole it from us. And 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 I told somebody, one of the cops that came to try and, um, you know, do some investigating over here. And, and, and I told him, you know what happens? The lower, the higher the need to survive, the lower the ethical values go. And when you will, if, if you want, if you need survival, you do anything to survive. Some people will even kill to survive. So then also what brainwashing uses is training, if, especially the ESPs, the emergency services personnel. And if you've been in the first level of training, we have discussed ESPs in, in broad, and, and we, we'll get back to that maybe in the future. But, but for now, you know, it's about training, you training the, the EMTs, the ESPs, the police, how not to freak out on an accident. That's also, you know, a way to use brainwashing to train people to think in another way. I mean, it can cause you a lot of trauma when you're not prepared to get to, get on a scene. I mean, if, 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 you, if I think about my life and what I've seen in my life, actually, I was supposed to be in a mental hospital by now because I've seen people amputated. I've seen people decapitated. A lot of bad things I've seen on, on you know, when, you, when you're a chap and you see these kind of things, you know. And, and, and also, it's important to speak about that. But in our training, we try to, you know, kind of not only duck fallig word. We do not want to be thick heads or something like that. We just want to be, you know, above the threshold of total annihilation or destruction mentally wise, because it can kill your brain or it can cause pain in your in your brain and it can cause your brain forever to change when you see these kind of things. They also use it for control. Abuse is about power and control. That's what abuse is about. The perpetrator wants to abuse. So what he'll do is he'll, you know, he'll, he'll make her think she's in survival mode. He'll make her think she's uh, under training as just to take control of her. So we, we talk about power and in the power um, of the perpetrator is manipulative as well as self-gratifying only for himself. The power is not about her, but it's about him. Sometimes we see, like, for example, in the jo in Johnny Depp case, that the perpetrator wasn't Johnny Depp in, that, in his case, but the perpetrator was Amber. Um, but the thing is, um, you know, she was very manipulative uh, because she wanted to con have control and power over him as well as self-gratifying. And, and yes, unfortunately, fortunately for Depp, um, all the truth came out. I mean, um, and that's why he took it to court. Otherwise, the, the, the social media mob, the news, news mob out there would have destroyed his career completely. And then also we've got abuse, like for example, they they will they will take control and they will abuse the person, um, his rituals, they will abuse them sexually, um, they will even abuse, uh, you know, the, the spouse and the child abuse. And then also we've got the crime of Patty Hearst. Let's just mention Worthy, just for interest sake, and, and it, will, it will blow your mind away what kind of brainwashing goes around in this world, because most of the um, you know, um, uh, some of the uh, cultic groups, they will use the brainwashing methods and they will, they will use these three pointers also in their mechanism to brainwash their followers, like, for example, the SLA. Um, now, the SLA, as you can see it on your slide over there, is the Symbionese Liberation Army. The Symbionese Liberation Army, they existed right about 1973 to 1975, somewhere in, in um, was it... Um, it was in America, but I think it was California. So this group committed bank robberies at the time. And that's and, and you can go and Google Pat Hearst and you'll find all of these things. Um, this, because the next video is about her. Now, this, this group, as they committed the robberies, as, and as well as two murders, as well as other attacks of violence, you know, they were so brainwashed to, to see nothing wrong with it. Like, for example, what happened in America not two years back, um, they were burning buildings and the news reporter would say, uh, it's a peaceful demonstration here in the streets of Chicago or in the streets of, where was the other place? Um, again, I cannot remember the name, but anyhow, it's a peaceful protest, but the buildings are burning behind him, you know, big buildings. It's not a peaceful protest when buildings are burned down. I mean, this is about, you know, taking control of a country, taking control of everything on the media. Now, Patty Hearst, this, this girl over here, her real name is actually Tanya. Well, uh, not her real name. Her real name is Patty, but her, her um, alias is 
um, called Tania. So she was kidnapped and became a, a member of the SLA or the Serbianese Liberation Army. She was arrested in 1975 in my birth year and imprisoned for robbery. She was released in 1975 and she was pardoned in 2001. Isn't it amazing? The Charles Manson followers. No, no, the Manson family was a desert commune and cult. Um, I found this on the World Wide Web. Um, you can go and also do your research on that. But I, let me just give it to you uh, about the Charles, Charles Manson followers. Now, as they were in this um, desert family or commune and cult formed in California in the late 1960s, it was led by Charles Manson. The group consisted of approximately 100 of his followers who, fought, who lived an unconventional lifestyle with habitual use of um, some drugs, you know, and most of the group members were young women from middle-class backgrounds, as well as, um, uh, you know, young ladies, for example, many of whom were, were, were um, uh, radicalized, radicalized, taking shot, uh, shotguns up and firearms by Manson's teachings and, and also drawn by hippie culture at that stage and communal living. And that's why the Bible speak about, you know, against communal living. I'm not talking about spouses, but, but speaking about uh, there's something wrong with communal living. Some years back, um, I was still in uniform. Um, I think, and well, when was it? Around about 2000, maybe 1999, um, when I was still a rookie. In, well, I wasn't a rookie at that time. I was already an inspector, but also doing chaplaincy ministry in the Metro Police Department back in the day. So I was invited by a lady to come and drink some coffee. Oh, yeah, I wasn't married. I didn't remember I at that stage. Um, yeah, no, it, so it must be 1998. Yes. But nevertheless, um, I went there and, and, and what happened was I met with this gorgeous lady and with a communal kind of thing, you know. They never knew I was a pastor at that stage. They only thought I was a uniformed member of the force and I was fortunate enough to be on an accident scene where they were in an accident and they invited me for coffee. I never knew it, that, that, that that people was the children of God movement <laughs> in Centurion. But the children of God cult also called the family. Now, the family international, you can go and see for yourself. Um, I've got a book here in my um, library as well as on my Kindle. What's the name? Ugh, why All the names is just out of my brain tonight. But nevertheless, and now... Um, I will get it now, but in any case, let me just tell you this first about the Family International. They are a cult, and they started in the 1968s, <clears throat> also in Huntington Beach in California. Now, it was originally called Teens for Christ, and later they gained a notary as the children of God. And, and you will see that many of these cults will change their name ever so often as soon as they are found out. Now, it was later renamed, and... Um, reorganized as the family of love and which was eventually shortened the family and it is currently called the family international now its founder and prophetic leader david burke who was first called moses david he lived in texas or well um, in the texas prison he gave himself the titles of king or the last end time prophet he called himself moses he called himself david he communicated with his followers via the mo letters um, the letters of instructions and counsel on myriad spiritual and practical subjects until his death in late 1994. So can you see, so many of these cults were born somewhere, and you won't believe it, many of them in, in California, the United States. So this is Patty Hearst in her story. Just sit and listen to this, and, and it will paint your brain. Believe me, so where is that? Let me just do this. There we go. And the information contained with our interviews with witnesses and the investigations made, she was acting on her own free will in our opinion. Up in Hillsborough, California, hearing their daughter described no longer as a witness but as a criminal now, the Hursts had this to say. I just hope everybody will remember that physically Patty is still a kidnap victim. She was taken away against her will. And psychologically, She's a victim of thought control by terrorists. I hope she'll give herself up and come home. She is believed still in or around Los Angeles. 
Police, for the last couple of days, have been moving from stakeout to stakeout, following one lead, then another, trying to find her and the few other SLA members who remain. I want to talk about the way I knew our six murdered comrades, because the fascist pig media has, of course, been painting a typically distorted picture of these beautiful sisters and brothers. Sin too loved the people with tenderness and respect. He helped me see that it's not how long we live that's important, it's how we live. Selena was beautiful. She exploded with the desire to kill the pig. She taught me how to fight the enemy within through her constant struggle with bourgeois conditioning. Gabi practiced until her shotgun was an extension of her right and left arms. She taught me the patience and discipline necessary for survival and victory. Zoya, female gorilla, perfect love and perfect hate reflected in stone-cold eyes. Faiza was a beautiful sister who taught me to shoot first and make sure the pig is dead before splitting, and I'll always love her. Kujo was the gentlest, most beautiful man I've ever known. Neither Kujo or I had ever loved an individual the way we loved each other. Our relationship's foundation was our commitment to the struggle and our love for the people. It's because of this that I still feel strong and determined to fight. Our comrades die in vain. The pig lies about the advisability of surrender have only made me more determined. I renounced my class privilege when Sin and Kujo gave me the name Tanya. While I have no death wish, I have never been afraid of death. For this reason, the brainwashed duress theory of the pig hearst has always amused me. Life is very precious to me, but I have no delusions that going to prison will keep me alive. And I would never choose to live the rest of my life surrounded by pigs like the hearse. Death to the fascist insect that preys upon the life of the people. It's scary, eh? She's talking about her own family as pigs. The ones who was, you know, fighting for her return. The ones who was looking for her all over the world after her kidnapping, you know? Um, And what's interesting also, um, about this is that um, what breaks my brain, of course, is, is is that these kind of people are accepted in our communities these days, like the SLAs, you know. They're accepted as normal people. They want to change the normal to their kind of normal. And it, there's nothing normal to call another person a pig because he doesn't believe the same way you do. And even myself, I don't call people pigs because they do not believe things like I do. But they do because they're brainwashed. Now, um, there's some common characteristics of abusers. For example, a need to control, a need to exert power over another by use of manipulation, and also a need for self-gratification. These were the first things we have discussed earlier, um, uh, and, and these characteristics of abusers. We find it in homes, we find it in cultic groups, we even find it in some churches. I do not want to call them even churches. You know, people making other people feel bad because they couldn't do this or couldn't do that, making them feel bad because you're not in church tonight, you or make you feel bad because you couldn't couldn't contribute. It's it's a way of control and power. And I say it very um, uh, well, careful because I'm also a pastor and I understand all of this. But there be, while there has been much study on the victim of domestic violence, there has been very little on the abuser. Therefore, it is difficult to understand why they abuse. And the reason why they abuse is because of their um, need for self-gratification. When somebody is trying to control another, they begin to think or attack their sense of self or their identity. And it's the best way to, uh, to break a person down is to go for their identity and to destroy or distort their identity. They start to say things that cause the victim to doubt who they are, you know? And that's what they did with many of the leaders in the world. That's conservative believers, believing people. Um, for example, they will tell this, the, 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 uh, the perpetrator will 
or the abuser will call the abuse and tell her you're a slut um, until she believes it. She's a slut because she did this or that, or you're worthless until she believes it. They will repeat it and repeat it and repeat it until she starts to feel worthless. And this, the, the perpetrator will also say something like, you're not a good mom for my kids. And he will, you know, he will complete um, and he will um, repeat himself all the time. Or he will tell her, you're ugly. Nobody wants you. It's only me that wants you. Nobody else wants you. So these attacks are repeated consistently for days and days, weeks, and sometimes even years. Now, as a result, the victim becomes disoriented, confused, and begin to doubt everything they believed in themselves, and, and they have no self-value anymore. Eventually, the victim will begin to adopt these same beliefs that's been spoken over her. It can happen also to the husband. The husband can be the, the abusee, and the wife the abuser. The idea of brainwashing is to destroy the old identity and replace it with a new one. To cover it, one that matches with the beliefs, the values, and ideas of the manipulator. The effects of an attack on the identity can last long after the victim is no longer in the abusive situation or in the abusive cycle because abuse has got a cycle. Remember, on level one, we discussed the, 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 the abuse cycle, you know, the honeymoon stage and so on and so forth. We're not going to go there. And, the, uh, and that's all about brainwashing. Now, brain, uh, common characteristics of abusers is a need of control, power, as well as self-gratification. And this is the wheel, or they call it the, and, and this is so small, I cannot even read it myself. <laughs> it's a, a physical violence, sexual um, wheel. They call it the power and control wheel. You, you can find it also online. You can find it and make, make a nice copy of that. Um, <clears throat> but understanding the power and control wheel, you need to, uh, some people use coercion and threats, like this is what, where we are at now, and the wheel goes on this, on, on, on this way. Um, it's not a, a two-way street, but normally one-way street, where the abuser makes his way the, the way, and not nobody else. Coerce, uh, coercive um, control is a form of domestic abuse, or intimate partner violence also. He describes a pattern of behaviors a uh, perpetrator uses to gain control and power by eroding a person's autonomy and self-esteem. This also can include acts of intimidation, threats, as well as humiliation. And then also we have the using the um, <clears throat> intimidation. I need to get some glasses on my eyes real quick. <laughs> using intimidation to control thought, looks, actions, gestures, smashing things, you know, to make, to make, uh, to, to scare them and destroying their property, you know, it's your cell phone, you just throw it against the wall or against the, um, against the floor or even displaying weapons, you know, and say, mm -hmm. just show it, just put it there, you know, this is all <laughs> forms of abuse. If you display a weapon after a fight, it means it's abuse. Using emotional abuse, for example, putting her down, you know, um, putting her down or um, making her feel bad about herself, calling her names, um, making her think she's crazy and, and he's not crazy. It's all about mind games. Who's right and who's wrong? You're always right and I'm always right. Uh, you're wrong. I'm always right. Or humiliating behavior or humiliating her in front of her friends, making her feel guilty about things. I will never forget a story I've heard some years back. It's about a, a guy who always abused his wife by calling her the mom of four. Let's go. When they're in a party or at church or wherever they are, and she's busy still speaking to her friends, he'll say, mom of four, let's go, please. And it's been going on for so long. You know, he's called, he, he doesn't call her on a name. He'll just call in front of people and say, mom of four. And then one day she just snapped and she said, oh, in front of everybody, she said, okay, dad of two, I'm on my way. <laughs> he never did that again. <laughs> he stopped with that kind of abuse. Now, also some others use isolation, controlling what she does or who she sees um, uh, and, and, and talks to, what she reads, where she goes, limiting her outside of her involvement. You know, many people abuse also through isolation, 
and and I, I, this, this is a very sensitive topic because you'll see such people in your church putting trackers on on their loved ones' cars, you know, to track them on their cell phones to see exactly where they are, you know, trying to control their ins and outs on, and who they see and who they may speak to. This is all, you know, the power and control will. Um, do not f- fall prey. And if you see somebody that fell prey in this cycle, just get them out of there, you know, because it will, if it will hurt them. It will hurt their relationship. And also then we've got minimizing um, or denying and blaming, not taking them seriously. Um, say the abuse didn't happen even, you know, or something like it was all a dream. It wasn't, it wasn't real. Using the children um, also plays a part of the power control wheel. And, and many spouses will use and abuse the children, say, uh, it, to pass a message to her via the children and making her feel guilty about the affection for the children. Um, and some people, they go through divorce and they still abuse the kids to pass messages via the kids to one another. And that's not right. You should keep the kids out of it. Because, because it's not the kid's fault that, that, that you've been abused or even that you've come to a, a place of, of separation. And then some others say um, use male privilege, um, treating her like a slave or a servant, acting like the master of the class, and, and that's not right. And then we've got the using the economy as abuse, um, preventing, <clears throat> preventing her from getting or keeping a job making her ask for money, um, giving her an allowance, taking her money even, you know, and that's what we call using economy for abuse. So all of these things, and, and what you can do is maybe if you sit with a couple in your office, they should mark these things where abuse plays part, you know, or plays a role in their lives because there's, there's many tools they use and, 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 and you need to kind of change this for them, but you cannot do it. They need to do it themselves. Now, there's some tools used to accomplish what, the, that, what they want to accomplish. And, 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 and the first tool they use is early verbal physical dom- uh, dominance. They, they um, overrule the, the conversations, you know. The abuser establishes that they is the boss, that I'm the boss. The victim may see the abuser as simply a strong person. Oh, my husband is a strong person. That's why I'm always quiet. It's not so because she's scared. She doesn't, she doesn't want to speak up against him. This leads to learned helplessness on the part of the victim because now the abuser trained his wife to keep quiet and that's what we call learned helplessness. So this there won't be in your test. I will tell you when something is in your test. So then don't stress out about all of these difficult things we, you hear tonight. But it's important when you speak as a chaplain in a domestic violence situation, you would know that there is many tools the abuser would use so that the abusee or the victim would think you know, I'm loved, I'm appreciated, but it's not so. She's brainwashed and she's, and, and she's taken away, um, um, you know, cognitively so that she may think everything is still fine. Now, they may also use threats of, of torture. You remember now, perception is reality. Perception is reality because when you threat of torture or pain, it may feel like you've already encountered the pain. Brainwashing thrives on the inner conflict of the person and therefore threat of torture works better than actual torture itself. Listen here. Revisit popping the balloon in the violent cycle in level one. Maybe we can spend some time on that also during this level two. Conflict is created by having to make decisions. Will the decision be correct? Will I pay a price for the wrong decision and etc.? Some other tools are also used in uh, manipulating and brainwashing a person is the awkward position they let you in. Begins as, as a battle of the worlds, but ends in complete internal destruction. Futility of the position overwhelms the victim, for example, standing in the corner or not being allowed to switch or twitch or move anything or not having the remote or not having your cell phone because you did this or that. And that's what we call the awkward position. Then we have the isolation, and the, this depends on the victim. The abuser will isolate the victim from her friends and tell her, and uh, the, you know, and, and, and her, as well as her family, he will take her, there, her, there, her away from them. And often geographically, they will even move away, maybe even move cities, you know, to get her away from her friends, to get her away from her, her loved ones, 
Now, the purpose is to weaken or destroy your support system because if that can happen, it will produce great influence of the abuser. So then there will, she would rely more upon the abuser. You understand? So that's why many abusers will move away from other loved ones or family members that dearly care for the victim. And another tool they use is the communication control type of tool. They block all channels of communications. Um, nobody may phone you. Nobody may text you. I want to watch and monitor your phone. The victim begins to look for a source of humanity. And, and, and the it's like the interrogator. Um, the, 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 um, the role of the perpetrator is like an interrogator. When, you, when she comes or when he comes from the job and normally... People, uh, ladies that are abused drastically, they may not even have a job because they will stay at home. And, and then when, when he comes home, he would want to inspect her phone. Um, I've heard even that some people, they would mark the car tires, you know, in the garage. And then he will come and he will inspect the car to see if the markings is still on the correct places on the tires. And then he'll go inside of the house and ask, so how was your day? No, my day was fine. Um, did you go anywhere? Oh, no, I was here the old day. I read Harry Potter's book, the new book, you know, something like that. And then you'll say, oh, okay. So why did the car move then? No, the car didn't move. And then the abuse starts. Fear also, uh, another tool is fear, arousal, and maintenance. Fear is created by verbal threats as well as um, <clears throat> physical abuse, the threat of violence, and can often be more effective than the actual violence itself. Uh, perception is reality. Before something happens, you, you can create enough fear response inside of you that it, it, it may even feel like it already happened. Um, for example, decision-making is often the source of great inner conflict for the victim. Another tool is guilt in induction. There's a constant blame that will cause the victim to become self-critical and self-blaming over herself to make as if she's at the wrong because of all of this, they will become or they will come to believe the abuse is their fault. I did this or I did that. That's why it hit me. There's no justification for such kind of abuse. They tear down the victim's value system so that they would think they were always on in the wrong. Um, <clears throat> victim begins to accept this system of the abuser. Another tool is the cock, um, a contingent expression of love, punishment for acts of displeasure as well as rewards for continued um, degradation, devaluating, as well as maligning. So um, they will break you down or they will love you and, and, and they will tell the victim, listen, it's, it's your choice. I can either love you or I can de degrade you. It's your choice. And they will play that game against the victim. Some other tool is the, the enforced lo loyalty to the abuser. Now, these tools I give to you not to go and to exercise these tools. Please, not, not, nothing like that. It's just to, to, to know that when you speak to an abusee or a, a victim of abuse, these are the tools the abuser has used upon her or him. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, enforce loyalty to the, um, to the abuser because of her view of self and her view of her abuser. She may believe she's the only one who truly understands him. She thinks so because he made her think so. She knows um, he, he, uh, how he can be during the honeymoon stage. You know, remember the stages, the honeymoon stage, and then the tension building, and then the outburst, as well as the, um, uh, you know, the forgiveness stage again. But that's, this is what we call the Stockholm Syndrome. And this is the identity with the abuser, to identify with the ab abuser, to say, you know, I'm aligning myself with the abuser. You know, he's my husband. I love him as he is. And then also another tool they use is the powerless, helplessness kind of tool. Um, what they'll do is they'll, they'll make you tired. They'll, they'll rob you from your sleep. They will keep you busy during the day and during the night uh, to tire you. And, and, and that's what we call the fatigue, um, power, powerless or helplessness. And then we've got control of water and food, as well as integrate unneed things as a reward. For example, if you are a good, good person today, I'll give you a cigarette or I'll give you some sweets, or I'll give you some caffeine um, to help you. Um, this is another tool. <clears throat> that is the risk with um, escape kind of tool. Um, this speaks to the insecurity of the person, or the abuser has been her source of security. 
So we will always play this card and tell her, listen, I provide for you. So this is what security is about. Excuse me. And the lethargy, it means feelings of depression brought on her or on by her, the mini self value. That's what we call the lethargy. And um, <clears throat> she causing herself to think less of herself. And then also we've got fear. They, they can also use fear. Uh, the abuser maybe have warned the victim that if she leaves, they will be killed. I will kill you when you leave. Another one, <clears throat> this is the last tool, is helping build alpha dependence. Now, they will offer, you know, social needs, like, for example, companionship. If you do not tell anybody about this, what just happened, I'll give you companionship. I'll give you direction. Um, or even approval as well as sanity. These are all tools that the brainwasher normally uses. Um, and the brainwasher, of course, um, will, will suffer the consequences of being brainwashed because even sometimes she will take sides with the dad, that's the brainwasher or the abuser, against her children because she's been brainwashed. Now, there's two things to remember. This is not your taste, don't worry. <clears throat> two things to remember. Abusers are liars. Hmm. Do you agree? Abusers are liars. They will never tell you the truth. If you come to a door and you see a lady is bleeding, he will tell you things never believe in. He will always lie. Abusers scapegoat the victim. That's what they do. Abusers are always self-serving. And secondly, the hallmark of abuse is the victims tell themselves a lie. They tell themselves a lie, people. For example, this is my fault. Or I probably deserved it. I asked for it. And what? And they believe the lie. So they are naive enough to believe it. Why? Because they've been brainwashed. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Any questions? So you'll only get a three-point question in this, in this whole segment. So I've already indicated to you where it is. All right. Is everybody good? Any questions? Brother Roderick, I see you raised your hand. Hi, Foster. Um, can you hey, man. Yeah, I can hear you well. Um, I just wanted to know, uh, when you speak about brainwashing and manipulation, um, mm -hmm. is there a, a line that you draw between the two or are they used um, synonymously? Like if you say yes. you are being brainwashed, you can also say, but I'm being manipulated. Yes, it's, uh, yeah. I guess manipulation isn't as big of a sin, if I may call it a sin, than brainwashing because brainwashing is the ultimate misdemeanor in any relationship where you really take control of the person's complete person, identity, destructive kind of thing, you know. Manipulation is, for example, a, a lighter kind of sin, again, if I can call it a sin, brother. And for example, if, you, if, if, if your wife manipulates you and say to you, listen, brother Roderick, my friend, my lovey, I'll give you the best time of your life tonight, but you need to. You understand what I mean? That's manipulation. That's not abuse, but it's playing the cards. You understand? Um, uh, or, 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 so, so, yes, there's, there's not a fine line between manipulation and brainwashing because brainwashing is an extreme, um, uh, extreme thing that abusers use to control a person. Manipulation, on the other hand, you can even manipulate your congregation through uh, coming to the tithing box and tell them, listen, um, you know, kind of manipulating them to bring more. You understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah but it will, be, it will be very difficult to brainwash a congregation because if they're adults and they know the scriptures, mm -hmm. it will be impossible kind of to brainwash them, you know, unless they are like a lot of sheep, goats. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Pastor. You're welcome, man. Any other questions? Well, I got some good news and bad news. We still have one session to go. Um, <clears throat> so this session is about the introduction to specialized chaplaincy. And if we do not take a break right now, yeah, and we move on, and I guess you still have some energy in here, we can finish before 9 o'clock. Is that okay? All right. Thank you so much. And if you need to go somewhere, you just drop the phone. Don't take it to the loo with you. Just drop it somewhere. <laughs> You do not want to hear everything in your house, okay? So um, 
you'll find the next segment on page 22. Let me just turn the page there. 22, yeah. Oh, no, yes, 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 yes. Let's go there. Page 22, Introduction to Specialized Chaplaincy Ministries. Now, this is kind of a, a broad brush thing, you know, um, specialized chaplaincies, because there's so many types of specialized chaplaincies. I love the segment. I love it so much that I, I think I must kind of, you know, elaborate it on it more, but it will take too much of our time. But I will just give you what you need to know for, for this section's sake. Okay. So, um, because this is what CSC is all about. Community services chaplaincy is all about specialized chaplaincy ministries. And, and how you find your own speciality. Because somewhere you'll, you'll fit in here. Now, this is an old statistic that's maybe um, I didn't update it because I do not know what's the current statistic at this stage, but it's, it's times 10 or times 20 more. Okay? So it's a lot more than, than this slide shows. And this slide was put here, I think, in 2013. So, it, yes, maybe it's time to update it, but we are more or less, we are already about 1,000 chaplains just here in South Africa, community services chaplains, but I mean, in worldwide, we probably are close to 100 plus thousand community services chaplains. Now, not every community services chaplain stay credentialized. Only when you apply for credentials, of course, after this training, you are allowed to carry a credential. My credential is here in my wallet. Some of you have received your credentials, and some of you, if some of you have you know, um, this is a credential. Some of you already, um, yours is in the post. And if, if not, it might be that there's some error in the system or error somewhere. I know that there is about six pe people's cards that got mixed up with names. For example, Mani's name was on Anthony Scott. I'll just give you an example, okay? <laughs> and, and, I, and I realized it, so I had to withdraw those cards, so it needs to be reprinted. So, but... But we give normally a credential time of a year. Every year you need to re-credentialize credential. But but for the postage sake, we, we, we give an extra six to eight months, you know, just to for in case you get it too late. But but these days we, we send it through Aramax, so it's very easy. So um so yes, there's many, many trained chaplains in the world, as well as certified chaplains. But you need to know people need you out there. People need you as a chaplain inside of the workforce, inside of the, your agency, where your res responsibilities are with, where you, you get a paycheck every month. They need you. And also, community services chaplains define God's call to a chaplaincy ministry because our ministry is all about ministry of presence. Now, this is a word you should never forget. When people ask you, what is a CSC? Now, this is a CSC, of course. What is a C what do you mean community service chaplain? Then you'll just tell them ministry of presence. And if they don't understand ministry of presence, you'll tell them it's a ministry of caregiving. You share, you care, and you sacrifice. That's what the theology behind the CSC is. So it defines God's call to a chaplaincy ministry. Now, CSCs are volunteers serving in different capacities. We serve in agencies, we serve in institutions. We serve in businesses. We serve also in the marketplace. We serve everywhere. We serve in soup kitchens. We serve in the police stations. We serve in hospitals. We serve on the waves at the ocean. We serve everywhere. So, yes, we do it. We just do it. This is what the CSC is about. Now, there's many chaplaincy models you can find in the world. And these are some simple examples. Um, it's just simple examples. It's just a couple of them. And, I mean, there's much more typical chaplaincy models. I mean, if yours is not here, it means you've got something you, you need to hold on to, you know. Uh, we've got the internet chaplains. I mean, many people love to browse on the internet. They love to check on Facebook to see if the people is okay. And then they will message people, you know, to their messenger inbox or DM them on the DM. It means direct message them on Twitter or something like that. And that's what we call internet chaplains, people taking care of people on the internet. I've got a couple of these friends of mine that do this, and that's an amazing ministry. Then we have the mall chaplains. Um, women normally like to be mall chaplains. You get, you get me? 
But we as males are more effective mall chaplains because the women, they will go from shop to shop to shop to shop to shop. But we, we stand and wait outside. So we are actually the mall chaplains, you know. We can invest some time in people. I mean, it takes nothing of us to just go to the managing person inside of the um, managing office and tell them, listen, is there anything, anybody, any, anything I can do for you? Is there maybe a prayer I can offer? Or is there maybe a, a, a problem you've got and maybe I've got a solution you, you need, you know? Discussion opens doors, people. Discussions really open doors. We've got train terminal chapters. We've got them. We've got airport chaplains. I, I like that kind of chaplaincy. I've, I've, um, and even if you are a chaplain and you go for a flight, immediately you identify as an airport chaplain. You know, um, it's not only the transit types that can identify. We can also identify as something uh, we're often not. Like, for example, if I'm not an airport chaplain, but if I'm on an airport, I'll identify as an airport chaplain. I will have and have conduct as a chaplain, as a as a voice of Christ in this world. And then we have the seaport chaplains, of course, a wonderful area because you can catch fish with them. And then the trucker chaplains, the, um, there's an American chaplain, beautiful person. Um, <clears throat> he's got a truck. There's a couple of them now at uh, this time. Because I've, I've met some of them in 2013 when I was there for a level three training um, in the U.S. So what happened was, um, they will pull on, pull their trailer with their truck. They will stop at the truck stops, and then they will invite everybody at the truck stop after eating and washing. They'll say, "Listen, come together. Let's come together around about seven, seven thirty p.m. at my truck stop." And then his truck at the back won't have any cargo in. It will only have chairs, like a church. They will get up there. They will have a wonderful service. And tomorrow he pulls away goes to the next truck stop, you see. Then we've got biker chaplains, uh, many biker chaplains here in Rustenburg. We've got RV chaplains, recreational vehicle chaplains. For example, the caravan clubs here in South Africa. Uh, if you like caravanning, you can be an RV chaplain. You can, you can, every weekend, I mean, you can go for RV and camping and you can be a chaplain and be the voice of Christ in this world. We've got hotel and taxi stand chaplains, bus and Rest stop chapters, but can you see? Can you see how, how, how wide the field is? There's many things that's not mentioned here because we do not have the time to mention everything, of course. But I mean, you can be any kind of chaplain where there's people you can support. Uh, there's a workable chaplain also. You know, I mean, these things is all people that's volunteering only. I mean, but then of course you can also work and volunteer as a chaplain inside of your workforce. You can go to your managing director and tell them, listen, I'm a trained chaplain. Here's my credential. And, and we find we have chaplains in manufacturing. People that's got um, you know, degrees in, in manufacturing, but they're also chaplains inside of the environment. We've got corporate setting chaplains. We've got um, factory chaplains. So, so can you see that it's, it's a very wide range of kind of chaplains. And then bus, a business office chap, uh, complexes, chaplains, campuses, um, schools and, and so on provide care and service as minister of presence once again. Benevolence services. You know what's the word benevolence? It's meaning you do good to other people. We've got crisis response ministries also, as well as religious rights chaplaincy. Now, <clears throat> we also have government helping agency chaplains. For example, federal, state government, local year, as well as um, national chaplains. And we've got chaplains here in South Africa, the SAPS chaplains. We have, we have the, the um, local government chaplains. I was a local government chaplain for, for about 19 years. And also they demonstrate their love and care to people, again, with the Minister of Presence, um, personal and family support, as well as pray at government functions. This is what the government chaplains do. That's all about that. I remember one time one of the government chaplains visited a communist Commissioner of the police, one call it, I won't say names, but nevertheless, he went out inside of the hospital and he um, visited the commissioner, this chaplain now, friend of mine. Um, we serve on some committees. Um, and what happened was, as soon as he left the chaplain now, the commissioner called him back and said, Hey, chaplain, don't you pray for me? The chaplain knew the commissioner was a communist 
but he still asked for prayer. So the chaplain turned around and said, of course, of course, commissioner, I'll pray for you. So anyhow, everybody needs prayer at the end. Government and church and other helping agencies, for example, the medical field. Medical field chaplains are a wide kind of range of chaplains, you know. There's hospital, hospice, and so on and so forth. Job training chaplains. And also um, temporary lodging chaplains, as well as food and feeding services. I like this kind of chaplaincy, the food and feeding services. You find this kind of chaplaincy you love when you're in full-time ministry. Uh, you know, your stomach always grows because um, you get a lot of food. And then we have sports and gaming facilities chaplains, like, for example, the, tra the race tracks and the old two, as well as the horse. I have never seen a dog race, but... Um, but but that will be nice to see, of course. But um, these are racetrack chaplains. Some people are addicted to racetracks. And they need chaplains because they lose a lot of money sometimes. And they'll need somebody's you know, shoulder to cry on because they've played out all of their money. Now they don't have money to buy food. And if the chaplain is there, you cannot provide maybe in money or in meals, but you can provide in support. And in this way, you can also help the person or the, the uh, you know, the person that's overplaying his hand all of the time, um, the addicted person. You can help him to recover or to recover. We have also the casino chaplains. Many people, they will sit on that casino chair and they will play the same machine for the whole day. And they're afraid to go to the bathroom because they knew, you know, if I leave this chair, somebody else is going to sit here and win millions. <laughs> And this is the problem with casino addiction. Um, so they won't leave the chair. They will just, you know, urinate in their pants at the seat. They won't even mind that. Um, so, yes. And when the chaplain is there, you can watch the machine for them. You know what I mean? Say, sir, really, I won't play. I, I promise you, I'm a chaplain. Yes, but, it's just, but please, you need to go to the loo. Or you need to go to go for a break or something. I will watch your machine. You know, I don't know if they're going to trust you. But, but it's, it's, it's worth the try. And then we've got professional ball clubs, chaplains. I always dreamt about being a rugby club chaplain, you know, for the Springboks when I was younger, but not these days anymore. I, I, I won't like traveling all the days of my life like they do. But there's baseball chaplains, there's football chaplains, there's bas basketball chaplains, soccer chaplains, rugby, any, any kind of chaplain you can think about. And then we have chaplain support fans, players and their families at this professional ball clubs at ball games. Then we have established growing chaplaincies also. For example, this is some of the important fields in chaplaincy. Um, it's a growing chaplaincy ministry. And it's not, after this training, it doesn't stop there. Your ministry will just start to expand and grow further and further. When I look at myself doing this training since 2012, uh, before that I was already a chaplain, but a full-time chaplain, Uniform, but this is not an, only a uniform chaplaincy ministry. This is uniform and non-uniform chaplaincy ministry. Um, I never thought that I would I would be involved in this kind of ministry for so long in my life. You know, um, never a dull moment. However, so yes, this domestic violence chaplaincy. You can specialize in one of these fields, and if you specialize in one of these fields, you tell your boss, you tell your superiors, uh, where you work, where you report, where you volunteer, at the hospital, wherever, that you specialize in domestic violence chaplains. This is your heartbeat. Because you cannot specialize in everything. You cannot. It's impossible to specialize in all of these chaplains' fields because they will eat you up. They will eat you up for breakfast and dinner and supper and everything. So yes, be mindful of yourself in your own time and, and be careful because you cannot specialize in everything. Of course, you'll have to have a a good knowledge about all of these chaplaincy disciplines to have you be, be, be prepared if God brings you to this. Um, then, of, of course, correctional chaplaincy is also one of the most growing chaplaincies in the country as well as in the world because our, our jail system just expands as we speak. We've got law enforcement chaplaincy. Now, this was my special speciality for 19 years um, as well as domestic violence and law enforcement, but because I love families. And, and the thing is about that, the law enforcement family is important because if, if the law enforcement is broken, all of society is broken. Can you see what's going on here in South Africa? Um, the law enforcement agencies are broken because of government non-support, you know, um, 
because I, I've spoke to the cops here where after the break-in here at church, and they say what happens is they arrest the perpetrator, he goes to jail, comes for his court case on, uh, because he will spend only the weekend or the night in jail. Then he comes for his court case, he gets bail, he offend again, he gets bail, again an offense, he gets bail, and so on and so forth, in and out, in and out, um, the whole time. So the police, they, you know, they, they feel negative about all of this because they do not get the, 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 the best support out there. Um, then also we've got the disaster response chaplaincy. We do not see a lot of disasters in South Africa, but I guess, you know, our chaplains there in Kozula Natal area, they did exceptional work during the disasters that happened, not only during the flooding, but also last year during the raids and, and, and all of that uh, havoc they caused in the Kozula Natal area, Durban especially. And then we've got the clinical chaplaincy. I love this field also. I love clinical chaplaincy. I love to do hospital chaplaincy. I love hospice chaplaincy. Um, to be there at the last moment for a person. I, it's not that I love that the person's got his last moment, but just to be there for them. You know, to, to hold their hand as they come, get from this world to the next. And then also extended care facilities for the elder people as well as for the ones who cannot take care of themselves. This is, these are all fields that shows growing possibilities. In other words, it can cause you to get remuneration in the future because the correctional services chaplains, community service chaplains, they get some money as well as the law enforcement chaplains, as well as disaster response and all of that. And then we have, um, Mika, would you just give this? Then we have the nursing retirement homes chaplaincy. We've got an alarm, so we are very panicking. If, if we get an alarm at the church grounds, we, we run around here to see what alarm is going off because of all the, the nonsense we have seen. So, yes. And also, we've got the nursing and retirement homes, yes. And of course, that's the last of the last. Is there any questions for you and I? I don't have questions, but if you do, it's a time to ask. Okay. Well, no questions. That means we're going to close. Isn't that wonderful? Of course, every, every time when we open our meetings, we open with prayer and we close with prayer. And if you feel late, um, to do a prayer, you just raise your hand. I will, of course, allow you to do that prayer for us. Okay. Well, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you that you've been um, superstars to stay awake. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment and thank you for helping us to help others. Because this ministry is not about us, it's about you and it's about your kingdom. It's about people. My prayer is, Lord, that you will bless each and every participant in this, in this venture, and that they will know that God is for them in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you very much, everybody. We have a good night. I'll see you on Thursday. We're not going to be long. We're going to be an hour or so just to discuss the five um, fears of intimacy. Okay. Have a good night. Shalom. Bye-bye. See you later. Where does that go?